what if everyone died in the beginning of Revenge of the Sith? And by everyone, I mean everyone on board the Invisible Hand, Grievous a ship. And that would include Anakin, Obi-Wan, Palpatine, Dooku, and Grievous. So what would happen if they all died? Let's find out. So in the original timeline, Maul had orchestrated the war on Mandalore to throw Anakin and Obi-Wan there so that he could kill Anakin to prevent him from becoming Palpatine's apprentice. That of course did not happen in the original timeline because Anakin and Kenobi were called to Coruscant when the Chancellor was kidnapped by Grievous, which led to Ahsoka going to Mandalore by herself. But in this new timeline, things would play out a bit differently. In this timeline, when Maul found out about Palpatine being kidnapped, which was all over the holonet, he figured that Anakin Skywalker, hero of the Clone Wars, would be called to rescue Palpatine, making it unlikely that he will be sent to Mandalore. And so, having realized this, in the alternate timeline, Maul changes his plans. Upon finding out about Palpatine's supposed kidnapping, Maul immediately got off his throne and ordered some of his loyal Mandalorian Super Commandos to take him to Coruscant so that he may face Skywalker and kill him there. Maul, of course, could not tell the Mandalorians what his exact plan was. Instead, he told them that they will go kill the Chancellor, which would allow them to deal a crippling blow to the Republic that has supported their enemies. The enemies here being Bo-Katan's Mandalorian resistance. This would allow them to write their names in Mandalorian history, Maul told the supporters. And so, after one energetic speech about this later, the Mandalorians cheered at Maul's decision and prepared to depart for Coruscant. And seeing the excitement of the Mandalorians to follow him to Coruscant, Maul was almost impressed at how easy it was for him to completely manipulate a race of warriors. And also, Maul knew that Skywalker would be safe on this rescue mission because he knew that Palpatine was Sidious, and that Sidious wanted Anakin alive. And so, having decided all this, Maul got into a specially designed Mandalorian ship, which had a cloaking device, and then, with some Mandalorians, left Mandalore, leaving the remaining Mandalorian Super Commandos to fight for Mandalore, whatever that meant, since they were fighting against other Mandalorians. Anyways, point is, in this timeline, Maul, along with a group of his Mandalorian loyalists, left Mandalore during the Siege of Mandalore to Coruscant. Also, Maul did wish he was able to take the entirety of his Mandalorian forces to Coruscant to maybe kill Palpatine as well, but that wasn't possible given that on Mandalore, they were actively engaged in a war. And all of this was very, very short notice. He and some of his few loyalist fools would have to do. Stealth would be how they would get Skywalker, Maul told himself. So not long after this, in the shimmering chaos over Coruscant where the future of the galaxy hung precariously in balance, Darth Maul's shuttle cloaked in shadows and secrecy, glided silently. The whole net burst with the news of Chancellor Palpatine's abduction by the cybernetic General Grievous, a plot so bold it shook the very foundations of the Republic. And Maul, with his cunning sharpened by years of survival and betrayal, detected that Palpatine, or rather Darth Sidious, his old master, would be aboard the Separatist flagship, the Invisible Hand. It was the most logical place for such a high-stakes prisoner to be kept in. However, Maul's concern was not with the Chancellor, but with the Jedi who would inevitably come to his rescue, Anakin Skywalker, and most probably Obi-Wan Kenobi. Maul would have loved to destroy his old master as well, but Maul knew Sidious well enough to know that that would not be an easy task. Anyways, as Maul's Mandalorian ship, cloaked in advanced technology, hovered near the Invisible Hand, his anticipation mounted. Maul then extended his senses through the Force, looking for the signature of any Jedi aboard the Invisible Hand, but he couldn't sense any, confirming to Maul that neither Anakin Skywalker nor any other Jedi was on board the Invisible Hand. He was still on his way, Maul told himself. From their vantage point, Maul and his Mandalorian warriors had a clear view of the Invisible Hand, so much so that they would know if someone boarded the flagship. And so, Maul waited for Skywalker to make his appearance. The Mandalorians, who still believed that Maul's only target is Palpatine, did ask him if they should find a way into the flagship themselves. But Maul, not believing he can destroy Palpatine, had made Skywalker his primary target. And he told them that entering the Invisible Hand by following the Jedi while still being cloaked would be the easiest way to go in there without losing the element of surprise. And the Mandalorians did not question him. And then, as he waited, Maul felt the presence of another through the Force. Count Dooku, the Sith Pretender, as Maul considered him. Maul's anger flared at the thought of Dooku, a mere pawn in Sidious's grand scheme, and doing the prestige and power that once might have been Maul's own. And following this, Maul looked for Palpatine's presence in the Force, but he found nothing. It was no surprise. Sidious's ability to conceal his presence was unmasked, a dark art that Maul 
begrudgingly respected. But his old master was in there, Maul was certain of it. And then, Maul felt a disturbance in the force. A beacon of light, or rather, two. Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi, it had to be them, Maul told himself. Initially, Maul perceived them only as shimmering threads woven into the force's tapestry, but soon, their starfighters became visible to the naked eye. There, Maul whispered, an edge of triumph in his voice. And so, silently, Maul and his band followed the Jedi. Cloaked and undetected, as Anakin and Obi-Wan breathed the invisible hands' defenses and entered its hangar bay. The Mandalorians then watched with bated breath as the Jedi swiftly dispatched the B-1 battle droids in the hangar bay. The Mandalorians asked Maul if they should attack the Jedi, and it was a good moment to try and attack the Jedi, but Maul seemed lost in thought, not responding to anything. And then, after a short moment of contemplation, Maul said the following, We need to do something else first. His voice a cold whisper of dark intent. Maul then observed as Anakin and Obi-Wan disappeared into a turbo lift after leaving their astromech in the hangar. And then, once the Jedi were gone, leaving the hangar bay empty, Maul got out and, along with his Mandalorians, began putting his plan into action. And now, let us turn our attention to Anakin and Obi-Wan as they made their way into the Invisible Hand. So, just like in the original timeline, Anakin and Obi-Wan could sense as the Force hummed with the presence of enemies and allies alike. I sense Count Dooku, Anakin declared, his focus narrowing on the task ahead. Obi-Wan, ever cautious, replied. I sense a trap, his voice tinged with the wisdom of countless battles. And amidst this exchange, Anakin senses prickled with the awareness of another dark presence, elusive and shadowy, casting a brief shadow over his thoughts. Yet, there was no time to ponder on this mystery. The Chancellor's plight demanded their immediate attention, and so, leaving r 2 2 behind with instructions to wait for orders, the two Jedi found a turbo left and headed towards the observation chamber of the Invisible Hand, which was where R2 pinpointed the Chancellor's location. Their journey from the hangar bay to the observation chamber was fraught with challenges, but determination drove them onward, until at last they reached the observation chamber. There, Palpatine sat, restrained, a grim welcome awaiting for them. And as Anakin and Obi-Wan approached Palpatine, he said something. Count Dooku, Palpatine intoned ominously as Anakin and Obi-Wan approached. Upon hearing this, both Jedi turned around, and upon doing so, they found themselves faced with Count Dooku. So, a short while before Anakin and Obi-Wan arrived in the observation chamber of the ship, Palpatine and Dooku had a conversation, just like they did in the original timeline as evidenced by the novel session for Image of the Sith. But here, in this timeline, the topic of their discussion was different. Palpatine, ever attuned to the cars of the Force, sensed Darth Maul's presence nearby, which he shared with Dooku. Will Maul pose a threat to our plans? Dooku inquired, concern lacing his words. And in response, Palpatine, with a dismissive sneer, regarded Maul as nothing more than a relic of the past, a discarded tool seeking purpose in a narrative that had long since moved on beyond his reach. Maul is a discarded tool, craving for relevancy in a plot that no longer needs him. Nothing he does will affect our cause. Sidious assured Dooku, his voice cold. But despite this conviction, Sidious did have Dooku order Grievous to scan the ship for Maul and kill him. Palpatine knew that face to face, Grievous would be no match for Maul's might. But Palpatine also knew that the Cyborg General had complete command over the ship, so... He could definitely slow down Maul with droids and possibly trap him somewhere. Or so Palpatine believed. Maul would not dare face him directly. That was not his plan. His rivalry for Kenobi, that might be the reason for this move, Palpatine figured. Or perhaps to maybe impress him and try to become his apprentice again, Palpatine thought. Anyways, after discussing all this with Dooku, Palpatine instructed Dooku to hide as Anakin and Obi-Wan were pretty close by at this moment. And now, coming back to the present, as soon as they found the Chancellor, Anakin and Obi-Wan also found themselves in the presence of Darth Tyrannus, otherwise known as Count Dooku, former Jedi, current Sith. The tension in the observation chamber only escalated as Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi clashed with Count Dooku in a fierce battle of lightsabers. Their blades a blur of motion and color. Obi-Wan Kenobi, caught off guard, was swiftly rendered unconscious, leaving Anakin to face the Sith alone. And as the duel reached its end, Anakin overpowered Dooku, severing Dooku's hands and forcing him on his knees, his life hanging in the balance between the Jedi's crossed lightsabers. Kill him. Kill him now, Palpatine said to Skywalker. And to this, Anakin responded with, I shouldn't, just like in the original timeline. 
But this is where the similarities with the original timeline completely end. Because at this moment, Chancellor Palpatine, with a hint of dark anticipation, was on the brink of uttering the fateful command that would have pushed Anakin further down the path to the dark side. Do it, he prepared to say, encouraging Anakin to execute Dooku and embrace his anger. However, before the words could leave Palpatine's lips, a palpable shift in the Force alerted all present to an impending threat. The threat of Darth Maul. Darth Maul, driven by vengeance and the desire to disrupt Palpatine's grand design, made his dramatic entrance at this point, flanked by a cadre of Mandalorian super commandos. The blasters aimed with lethal intent at Anakin and Palpatine. So suffice to say, Maul's presence transformed the situation entirely. The pathetic General Grievous had failed to stop Maul, Palpatine realized. But no matter. He will deal with this. That's what Palpatine believed. And seeing Maul appear, Anakin's attention was also diverted away from Dooku and onto Maul. This is the first time Anakin had seen Maul ever since Maul tried to run him over on Tatooine roughly 13 years ago at this point. And then, Maul's voice, cold and menacing, broke the silence. Note so fast, CTS, your grand design ends here, he declared, his statement echoing through the chamber. A challenge not just to Palpatine, but to the very destiny the Sith Lord had envisioned for the galaxy. The Mandalorians, their weapons craned on Anakin and Palpatine, awaited Maul's command, ready to alter the course of history with a single word from their brave leader. And then, with a calm yet malevolent grace, Maul began to articulate the evolution of his plan. My original intent was solely to end Skywalker, your prized pupil. His voice a venomous hiss that slithered through the tense air. But the force has guided me towards a more significant triumph. A chance to crush Darth Sidious himself, Maul spat the name, but the disdain so palpable it seemed to darken the room further, ensuring that all present understood the true identity of Palpatine as the Sith Lord orchestrating the galaxy's downfall. To those who were aware of Sidious anyway, which in this case would only include Anakin, and Obi-Wan who is still lying unconscious. The Mandalorian commandos, loyal to Maul yet unaware of the depth of his scheme, exchanged uncertain glances. As far as they knew, Maul had led them here to kill Palpatine, not Skywalker or Sidious. Their mission had just expanded beyond their comprehension, but their faith in Maul's leadership remained unshaken. Such was their trust in their leader. Sidious, one Mandalorian muttered under his breath, the name not familiar, yet clearly significant, echoing with dark portents. And Palpatine, sensing the precariousness of his position, yet refusing to display any signs of weakness, commanded Anakin. Anakin, destroy that man. Do not heed his fabrications. But before Anakin could act, Maul, with a calculated dramatic flair, discarded his upper garment, revealing a vest wrapped with charges attached to his chest. Try to attack me or any of my warriors, and I will activate these charges. And we will all share the same fate, he declared, his case logged onto Anakin's, the threat unmistakable. Anakin, turmoil raging within him, found himself at a loss, his mind a whirlwind of confusion and suspicion. Was Maul actually saying that the Chancellor is Sidious, he wondered? Anakin didn't even know what was happening anymore. And then, Maul, detaching himself from the group of Mandalorians, advanced towards Palpatine. His every step was measured, deliberate. Along the way, Maul's attention briefly shifted to Obi-Wan, who lay unconscious beneath debris. With a gesture of the Force, Maul cleared the rubble, flinging Obi-Wan next to Anakin. Wake up, Kenobi, he commanded, an odd, almost mocking tone lacing his words. Obi-Wan's eyes fluttered open, and the scene that greeted him was one of utter disarray. Dooku incapacitated and missing his arms, Anakin standing bewildered with two lightsabers drawn, Mandalorians arrayed with lethal intent, and Darth Maul with charges strapped to his chest, approaching them. What is happening, Obi-Wan thought, his mind struggling to grasp the chaos before him. And noticing the confused expression on Obi-Wan's face, Darth Maul turned to face him, his voice heavy with revelation. The Sith Lord you've been looking for, Sidious, there he is. Maul said, pulling towards Palpatine. What absurd nonsense is he saying? Palpatine retorted with practiced indignation, a masterful display of feigned innocence. His performance was convincing, yet beneath the surface, the Sith Lord was calculating his next moves. And when Maul sensed that the two Jedi before him did not believe him, frustration marred his features. Turning to Dooku, who lay defeated and disarmed, Maul pressed him. Tell him, Tyrannus, Sidious, plaster discard you, just as he did me. 
tell the Jedi the truth. In response, Dooku said nothing. His face was a mask of contemplation as he weighed his dwindling options. Alright, I see you require further evidence, Maul conceded, stepping aside to maintain a safe distance. The charge is trapped to his chest, a clear barrier to any direct assault from the Jedi. And then, once Maul was at a safe distance from where Palpatine was restrained, he commanded his Mandalorians to open fire on Palpatine, and they did so. And as soon as this happened, Anakin and Obi-Wan instinctively moved to deflect the blaster bolts, engaging in a desperate defense of the Supreme Chancellor. And then, Maul, with a powerful force push, sent Anakin and Obi-Wan flying across the room, allowing the blaster bolts to find their mark in Palpatine. But then, as Maul, Anakin, and Obi-Wan was, the blaster bolts halted mid-air, inches from Palpatine's face. Look, Maul said, pointing at Palpatine. Now do you believe, he asked. Chancellor, Anakin gasped, the reality of the situation beginning to dawn on him. Laughter erupted from Maul as the facade around Palpatine crumbled, revealing the Sith Lord's true power. And then, as everyone watched, Palpatine redirected the suspended bolts right back to where they came from, back at the Mandalorians, who narrowly avoided the counterattack. And amidst this turmoil, Palpatine's mind raced for a way out, plotting his next steps to salvage his grand scheme and return to Coruscant. And observing Palpatine's contemplative gaze, Maul mocked, Planning your escape, Master? There is no way out of this, Maul assured his former master. And then, Maul turned around to face his Mandalorian allies. He gave them a resigned nod, which would have seemed to imply that Maul acknowledged their loyalty and that their part in his plan had come to an end. And upon seeing this nod from Maul, the Mandalorians exchanged looks of respect with their leader before exiting the observation chamber of the ship, leaving the Jedi and the Sith to confront the unraveling conspiracy among themselves. As the standoff in the observation chamber reached a fever pitch, Palpatine found himself ensnared in a web of his own making, his mind racing through scenarios to untangle the predicament before him. The Jedi have witnessed my use of the Force, Palpatine acknowledged. But Palpatine, of course, knew that simply being Force-sensitive, or even being a Sith, was not illegal within the Republic law. He understood that even if the Jedi Council, through Obi-Wan and Anakin, were to find out his ability to use the Force, could not act against him, not legally, not without concrete evidence, which they did not have. The Senate, along with the Security Council, would scoff at the notion that I had been orchestrating the Clone Wars from behind the shadows. There is simply no tangible proof, Palpatine reasoned within his mind, diminishing the idea that his political career would be jeopardized by more accusations and by what Anakin and Obi-Wan had witnessed. And having arrived at this conclusion, Palpatine determined that the true issue at hand was the immediate threat Posed by Maul and the explosive vest he wore. Dooku, now disarmed and effectively neutralized, posed no significant threat. And as for Anakin and Obi-Wan, as Palpatine could sense, they were clueless as to what to do. And if they did try to take him on, Palpatine was confident that they wouldn't be a match for him. And so, the real challenge lay in addressing Maul's presence and the implications of his actions. Maul is the primary obstacle, Palpatine concluded. Maul's intentions were clear. Darth Maul knows that he cannot defeat me. Perhaps he hoped the Jedi would align with him. No, that's improbable. The Jedi wouldn't be swayed by his words, Palpatine thought. And as Palpatine was processing the situation, Maul's voice again pierced the tense silence with an offer directed towards the two Jedi. Join me, Jedi. Together we can end Sidious. You can save the Republic and your order. Now is our chance. Even if you somehow manage to defeat me without these charges going off, he will kill you, Maul said, pointing at Palpatine. And as Maul was desperately trying to rally support, Palpatine meticulously crafted his counter-strategy. Palpatine figured that his way out of the situation was not through the formidable power of the Force, but through the cunning and manipulation that had elevated him to the pinnacle of the Galactic Republic. Palpatine understood that direct confrontation with Maul, especially in his current position, was untenable. Maul would simply activate the charges he had strapped onto himself. However, Palpatine's keen eye soon caught the sight of Dooku's lightsaber lying within reach, a tool that could prove decisive in the moments to come, Palpatine reasoned. Palpatine's mind, a labyrinth of machinations and plots, began to weave a new narrative from the chaos Maul had brought. Calm the beast, then strike swiftly, he counseled himself, envisioning a scenario where he could exploit a moment of vulnerability 
in his former apprentice. Palpatine knew well that Maul's passion and thirst for revenge could be his undoing. Palpatine needed only to feign weakness, to plead or perhaps offer a deceitful olive branch, and once Maul's guard dropped, even for a fraction of a second, he would seize Dooku's lightsaber and then end the threat of Maul permanently, without giving Maul time to activate the charges he had on him. And so Palpatine now had a plan to deal with Maul, yet Palpatine was acutely aware of the larger picture and the implications of his actions. Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, ever the stalwart guardian of the Jedi Order's morals, sent Anakin Skywalker, Kenobi's former apprentice, with whom Palpatine had sought to forge a new era, could not be left as loose ends. Palpatine realized there was no way to get rid of Kenobi and somehow convince Anakin to join him. Palpatine knew this. There was not enough time for that. And so, with clinical detachment, Palpatine concluded that both Jedi must be eliminated. The loss of Skywalker will be regrettable, but sacrifices are necessary for the greater vision to be realized, he acknowledged internally. And so, Palpatine's escape plan crystallized. An emergency escape pod would serve as his means to flee the Invisible Hand, leaving behind a narrative of tragedy and heroism as cover for his retreat. Palpatine envisioned a story that would be spun in the aftermath. The brave Jedi, Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi had perished valiantly rescuing him from the clutches of General Grievous. The Republic would mourn, the Jedi Order would reel from the laws, but none would suspect the truth behind the tragedy. It was a narrative that the Senate and the Galactic Populace would embrace without question, further solidifying Palpatine's grip on the galaxy. In this dark reflection, Palpatine found a perverse solace. All is proceeding as I have first seen, he reassured himself, the machinations of fate and the Force remain under his control, a testament to his indomitable will and cunning. Or so Palpatine believed. So all this planning would have happened inside Sidious' mind within a few short moments. And now coming back to what happened after that, Maul kept trying to convince Anakin and Obi-Wan that they needed to end Sidious, but Anakin, deeply conflicted, struggled to reconcile his loyalty and admiration he held for Palpatine, who had been a mentor and a father figure to Anakin throughout the years. The idea of acting against the Tassler without due process of the Republic's laws was abhorrent to him. Even if what you say is true, it's not our place to take the Chancellor's life, Anakin asserted. And Obi-Wan, ever the adherent to the Jedi Code and the protocols that govern the Republic, echoed his former apprentice's sentiment. Our duty is to the Republic and its laws. We cannot bypass the Senate and decide Palpatine's fate on our own. Turning to Vol and the Duduku, he extended an offer. You both have a chance to testify before the Senate, to clear your names and reveal the truth. Then, as the room fell into a brief silence, Anakin's attention turned to Palpatine, who had remained rather quiet throughout this confrontation. Chancellor, you've been silent for quite some time. Do you not have anything to say to all this? Anakin inquired, seeking some reassurance, some denial that could put his swirling thoughts to rest. But before Palpatine could craft a response, Maul interjected with a grim certainty. He's already foreseen a way out of this. He's always steps ahead of everyone. Palpatine, maintaining his calm demeanor amidst the escalating tensions, finally spoke. I assure you, Master Jedi, everything this being is saying is a lie. I will present my case before the Senate and explain everything there. My use of the Force is something I kept hidden for reasons that too I will explain before the appropriate legal bodies. He stated, his voice steady, betraying none of the turmoil that surely raised within him. And having said this, Palpatine then prepared to enact his plan, to lead him to a place of vulnerability, to end him. But Palpatine of course couldn't speak with Maul as his former master, as that would immediately confirm to Anakin and Obi-Wan that he is indeed Sidious. Palpatine wanted to maintain that air of doubt within the Jedi's mind, at least until Maul was dealt with. And so, because of that, Palpatine knew that he'd have to use words with double meaning lays through them while speaking with Maul. But that was something Palpatine could easily do. But before Palpatine could even begin to do that, Maul, recognizing the depth of the machinations at play, said the following. Ah well, I was hoping to spend some more time in the galaxy, but it seems that won't be happening. That is what Maul said, a cryptic note of finality in his tone. Obi-Wan, puzzled by Maul's statement, pressed him for clarity. What do you mean, Maul? Obi-Wan asked. You're about to find out, Kenobi, Maul declared. And as he did so, he didn't look at Kenobi, but instead towards his old master. As he no doubt knew that his old master was wondering the same question as Kenobi. And so, to find out what Maul meant by this, let's now turn our attention to General Grievous. So as all this is happening with Maul Palpatine at the Jedi, 
Grievous is on the bridge of the Invisible Hand. Grievous couldn't find more as per Dooku's instructions and was now worried if that would end up causing too much problems. And right then, confirming that doubt by Grievous, one of his B1 battle droids approached Grievous and showed him a data pad, telling the Cyborg General that he needs to look at this immediately. And then Grievous did so. He looked at the data pad as the B1 battle droid explained what he was really looking at. And mere moments after looking at this data pad and listening to the B1 explain what was going on, General Grievous pushed the droid out of his way and ran to an escape pod. He then jumped into an escape pod and tried to leave the invisible hand, but the escape pods were not working. There was some kind of an error. No matter what Grievous did, the escape pod stayed where it was not allowing Grievous to escape. And so, Grievous rushed out of the escape pod and made his way over to one of the ship's hangar bays. But the hangar bay doors, which were made out of steel, were closed. And just like the escape pods, these steel doors were also unresponsive. Grievous didn't know what was happening, and soon, with extreme horror, Grievous realized that he was locked inside the Invisible Hand with no way out. So the reason why Grievous wanted to desperately leave the Invisible Hand and why he couldn't was because the Mandalorians under Maul's command had executed a final devastating maneuver. They had left the Invisible Hand by this point, but before leaving the ship, they had sliced into the ship's computer and forced a complete shutdown of all exits from the ship. But that is not all they did. They also made sure that none of the escape pods would work. And as for why they did that, like mentioned in the beginning of the story, after entering the Invisible Hand in their invisible cloaked ship, Mole told the Mandalorians that they needed to do something before going after the Jedi and Palpatine. This thing they needed to do was silently plant numerous explosives around the Invisible Hand's hyperdrive engine. The intent of this was to cause an explosion significant enough to destroy the entire vessel and everyone aboard it. And in this effort, immediately after setting the charges, a timer was activated by Maul and the Mandalorians, ensuring that the charges would go off no matter what after a fixed period of time. Maul and the Mandalorians knew that they would have to get out of the ship before that happened. But Maul has said that he might end up staying for Mandalore, he said. But it was really to ensure that Sidious died. This was the meaning behind the resigning nod Maul gave to his followers. It was a silent command to enact their part in a plan to leave the ship and shut all the exits, to ensure that no one would escape the Invisible Hand. And upon receiving this signal from Maul, the Mandalorians knew that Maul had made his decision to stay aboard the ship. Maul was a true leader of Mandalore, they all told themselves as they left the Invisible Hand. And so the reason why Grievous was so terrified and wanted to leave the ship, that was because his Beyond and Battle Droids had discovered that the Hyperdrive Engine would blow up very soon. In fact, by the time he realized it, Grievous knew that he only had a few short moments left. Not enough time to do anything. And this is also what Mole meant when he told the Jedi and his old master that they're about to find out. Mole wanted Sidious gone, even if Sidious somehow managed to change Mole's mind about killing him, which Mole knew Sidious was capable of. And so, at this moment, as Mole stood in front of Sidious, Anakin, Nobi Wan, and Dooku, the tense silence was shattered by a distant explosion. The charges were going off. Right on time, Maul said as he heard this, an eerie calmness in his voice. And but at this moment, the revelation of Maul's plan became immediately clear to those present. The invisible hand was doomed to become debris, floating in the vastness of space. Maul then looked at everyone present and explained the futility of seeking escape. I wouldn't bother with the escape parts, he said. His voice a harbinger of impending doom. In a few very short moments, the ship will be dust. And besides, all exits have been sealed shut by my loyal Mandalorians. None of us are going anywhere, Maul said with intense conviction. The tension escalated as more explosions reverberated through the ship's structure, each one a grim countdown to their final moments. And at this point, when everyone was certain that they're most probably going to die now, that Maul, with his swift movement, removed the explosive charge trapped in his chest. And after doing that, Maul plunged his lightsaber into it. And then, to everyone's shock, nothing happened. The supposed explosive did not detonate. A fake, Maul revealed, a grim satisfaction in his tone. In fact, everything Maul said and did was an act. An act meant to fool and misdirect Sidious, who was so confident in his abilities. And beyond that, another purpose of Maul's act was to embarrass Sidious. 
If Mole wanted to simply kill Sidious, he could have walked in there with an actual charge and then blew it up. But Mole wanted Sidious to know, before he died, that even though he was marred, the others around him, the people he considered beneath him, were not stupid. And at this moment, Mole has done just that. So a quick side note, the reason why neither the Jedi nor Palpatine could sense that Mole's charge was fake? Well that was because Mole's anticipation of death was genuine. The intense reality of his own end due to the ship being rigged to explode mirrored the emotions he would have felt had the explosive strapped to his chest been real. This depth of conviction blurred the lines between reality and deception, masking the truth of the situation from even the most sensitive to the Force. Mole's final insult to Sidious. And then, the realization that Mole had indeed not lied about the ship's fate set in as more explosives sounded. A cacophony heralding their end. There was no attempt to escape. They were trapped in a vessel, swiftly cascading towards its destruction. It also became evident that cutting through the ship with a lightsaber would offer no salvation. They were adrift in space, and any breeze would only hasten their demise. Had the ship been in the atmosphere of Coruscant, they may have been able to cut through the ship and maybe survive, but that was not going to happen here. And so, as the Invisible Hand continued its catastrophic descent towards annihilation, Sidious realized that the millennia-long plan of the Revenge of the Sith had turned into Revenge of a Sith Mole. And by this point, having no further need to maintain a facade of not being Sidious, Sidious finally destroyed his restraints and turned his full wrath upon Mole. The Sadbrack stood, laughing, unfaced as Sidious unleashed a torrent of force lightning towards him. Mole then defended himself with his dual battle lightsaber, the electricity cracking against the energy of the blade in a stark display of their conflicting powers. However, the duel between Mole and Sidious soon faded into the background for Anakin and Obi-Wan. Their attention was drawn elsewhere when Count Dooku, who had been silent until now, finally spoke. His voice carried a weight of resignation. Obi-Wan, he began, prompting Obi-Wan to approach him. I did not want this, I... Dooku's voice trailed off, but Obi-Wan offered him a look of understanding and acknowledgement of the complex web of choices and consequences that had led him here. It was then that Anakin called out, Master, he didn't ask what we should do. Both of them knew the situation was dire, beyond hope of escape. This is not the end, Anakin, Obi-Wan stated, even though they could sense the explosions getting closer to them. He then suggested with a heavy heart, you should call Padme, Anakin. The unspoken implication hung between them. It was a goodbye. And understanding Obi-Wan's intent, Anakin quickly activated his comlink, and Padme's form quickly flickered to life before him. Anakin, she exclaimed, her voice a mix of relief and concern. Anakin struggled for worse, his eyes briefly meeting Obi-Wan's before staring out into the chaos that surrounded the invisible hand. Padme, I... I don't think I'll be coming back. Anakin confessed, the reality of their fate finally setting in. Meanwhile, as Anakin continued to speak with Padme, Obi-Wan had contacted Mace Windu, swiftly briefing him on the catastrophic events that had unfolded and the revelation about Palpatine being Sidious. And through Obi-Wan's calm link, Mace could see Palpatine engaged in a pointless battle with Darth Maul, which Palpatine was winning, it seemed, but no one really cared. And at this point, Dooku had also offered a confession about Palpatine and warned of the threat of Order 66. Dooku told them that only the Supreme Chancellor could execute Order 66 and to be careful. And after making these revelations, Obi-Wan told Mace that he and Anakin would not be returning to Coruscant and that this would be their final mission for the Republic and the Jedi Order. But Obi-Wan did go on to add that, at least now, the Sith have been destroyed by another Sith. The Order and the Republic are indebted to you, Master Kenobi, and to Skywalker. May the Force be with you, May said. We will be with the Force soon, Mace, Obi-Wan replied, ending the call with a sense of finality. And now coming back to Anakin and Padme, as the destruction of the ship almost reached the observation chamber, Padme was convinced by Anakin that this is the end. And now finally believing that, despite not wanting to, Padme urgently said the following, Anakin, there's something I have to tell you. Anakin, amidst his turmoil, urged her to continue. You will be a father, Anakin, she revealed, her words carrying extreme sorrow. For a future, they would never see together. And then, before Anakin could even process this life-changing news, he and all else aboard the Invisible Hand were engulfed by flames. And on Padme's end, the connection with Anakin's gumling went dead. In those last moments, the fate of the heroes and the villains alike were sealed in a blinding light, their stories ending in the cold silence of space. And so, to answer the question, what would have happened if everyone died on the Invisible Hand, well, 
as her family with the Anakin gone, she would dedicate her life to her career as a politician. She would survive childbirth and Padme would surrender Luke and Leia to the Jedi Order, where they would go on to become Jedi Masters. And as for the Jedi Order, Dooku telling them about Order 66 and also the location of the Separatist leaders, which was an Utapal, they would be able to immediately arrest the Separatists, swiftly putting an end to the Clone Wars. And then following this, clone production would be seized on Kamido, and a galaxy-wide operation would begin to remove the inhibitor chips from the clones. But it would not be made public knowledge that the inhibitor chips were there to force the clones to kill the Jedi. Instead, the idea behind the removal would go as follows. The clones have served their purpose. Now they should be allowed to live their lives. And they should not be hindered by any behavioral modification enabled by some kind of chip. And so the clones would be made harmless. And as for the punishment to the Kaminoans, well, the Kaminoans always believed that the inhibitor chips were there to allow the clones to go after rogue Jedi. So side note, the inhibitor chips were not created by the Kaminoans. Instead, they were given to them by Count Dooku. In fact, the Kaminoans always thought that Count Dooku was a Jedi and they knew nothing of the Sith. So in the end, the Kaminoans would be forgiven for their misunderstanding. And so the Jedi Order would go on to prosper. Anakin and Obi-Wan would be honored and Anakin would be posthumously given the rank of Master. He did pass a trial after all. And then, coming to Ahsoka Tano, in this timeline, with Maul not on Mandalore, she and bo would be able to easily take control of Mandalore. bo would be made regent of Mandalore, following which Ahsoka would return to Coruscant with Captain Rex. And when she got there, she too would find out about Anakin and Obi-Wan's sacrifice, and motivated by this mainly, she would rejoin the Jedi Order as a Jedi Knight, eventually becoming the Jedi Master to one of the twins. And as for the Republic itself, with Palpatine gone, there were no more secret wars, and for the time being, there was peace, until the next threat showed up. Which, as Balan Skull says in the Ahsoka series, keeps on happening. Okay, so that was it for this what if, and thank you to ZachCross7190 for suggesting this video. Thank you, Zach. And with that being said, if you liked the video, do consider leaving a like and subscribing. And if you feel like helping out the channel, if you have the time, do check out my Patreon, link should be in the description, where for $1 or more, you can get early access to videos, a shout out in every video, and access to exclusive content. Which, I do plan on posting there. Anyways, that is it. Goodbye, have a good day, and stay hydrated.